Well, let me uh, begin in a slightly technical way. A person who's interested in studying language is faced with, the, with a very definite empirical problem. He's faced with an organism, a mature, uh, let's say, adult speaker, who has somehow acquired an amazing range of abilities which enable him in particular to uh, say what he means, to understand what people say to him, to do this in a, in a fashion that I think it's proper to call highly creative. Now, the person who's acquired this intricate and highly articulated and organized uh, collection of abilities, the collection of abilities that we call knowing a language, that person has been exposed to a certain experience. He has been presented in, his, in the course of his lifetime with a certain amount of, of data, uh, of, inform of direct experience with the language. And we can investigate the data that's available to this person. And having done so in principle, we're faced with a very clear and a reasonably clear and, and well delineated scientific problem, namely the problem of accounting for the gap between the really quite small quantity of data, small and rather degenerate quantity of data that's presented to the person, to the child, and the very highly articulated, highly systematic, uh, profoundly organized uh, resulting knowledge that he somehow derives from this data. Uh, furthermore, even more remarkable, we notice that in a wide range of languages, in fact all that have been studied seriously, there are remarkable limitations on the kinds of system that emerge from the very different kinds of experience to which people are exposed. Well, this, there's only one possible explanation for, in, in a, in a, what one, one can say in a rather schematic fashion, uh, for this uh, remarkable phenomenon, namely the assumption that the individual himself uh, contributes uh, a good deal, an overwhelming part, in fact, of the general schematic structure and perhaps even of the specific content of the knowledge that he ultimately derives from this very scattered and limited experience. That is, to put it rather loosely, the child must begin with the knowledge, certainly not with the knowledge that he's hearing English or Dutch or French or something else, but he does start with the knowledge that he's hearing a human language of a very narrow and explicit type that permits a very small range of variation. And it's because he begins with that highly organized and very restrictive schematism that he's able to make the huge leap from scattered and degenerate data to highly organized knowledge. And I would claim then that this instinctive knowledge, if you like, this schematism that makes it possible to derive complex and intricate knowledge on the basis of very partial data is one fundamental constituent of human nature. But then I assume uh, that in other domains of human intelligence and other domains of human cognition and even behavior, uh, something of the same sort must be true. Well, the collection of this uh, mass of uh, innate scheme, uh, schematisms, uh, innate organi organizing principles, uh, which guides our social and intellectual uh, uh, and individual behavior, that's what I mean to refer to by the concept of human nature.